I wish I could say because in my job description, in my job titles, the word pastor, that I'm really good at it. But prayer is one of those things that it's probably the most effective yet under, underutilized tool that we have. I, and at least in my life. I can't speak for you. But so oftentimes, um, that's just how prayer is. Um, I, I, I'm excited about this time of year. Um, my boys play baseball, and then we're about a week away from Cardinal baseball. And if you follow Cardinal baseball, one of the biggest acquisitions of the offseason was when the Cardinals got Nolan Arnato to come here and play for us. And it's very exciting, and he's one of the best players in baseball. Um, and if in a week from now, when baseball started, if Mike Schilt, the manager of the Cardinals, said, yeah, I'm not going to start Nolan Arnato." I'm pro- I'll let him play some games. I might sub him in late or have him pitch run or, you know, come in late for, de- in which he's very good on both sides of the, you know, he's very good at defense. He's a very good hitter. Um, he's a perennial all-star. But if Mike Schilt, the Cardinals manager, said, I, I'm going to let him play every fourth or fifth game, there would be an outcry, and not just from the fans, but from the Cardinal organization, say, why would you not utilize this player. He's so productive and so effective, and the fact that you're not going to him that much, or you're keeping him on the bench, or you're not utilizing him at the top of the lineup where he gets the most opportunities to be effective for the team, for the win, you're just not managing your assets well. You're not being a good steward of that. And I feel oftentimes that's how it is with us when it comes to prayer. Because prayer is one of the most effective things we have. And if you're anything like me, sometimes it's a struggle to do the discipline of prayer. Sometimes I think we don't like to be that it's a discipline. You know, I'm like, oh, I, should, I should want to pray. I shouldn't have to schedule it. Hear me, schedule it. Because if you don't, you won't do that. And so the fact that it's so important, here in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is teaching on the Beatitudes. And he, what's really cool for simple people like myself is Jesus said, hey, here's how you pray. You want to know how to pray? Here's a model to which you pray. And some of you have heard this prayer a lot, depending on your church background. Maybe you've never heard it. That's fine, too. Some of you have repeated it over and over as a part of your religion growing up and when you went to church. Some of you have said it a lot, but you've never fully looked at it and understood it. Well, that's what we're doing in this series. And last week, Ben talked about um, the person that we're praying to. Um, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, or thy name be holy, is um, how we talked about that last week. And um, the person that we're praying to, and, and hear me, names matter. You know, especially when you look out in the world and there's a lot of gods, little g, and sometimes there's this kind of universalism to where, you know, well, you pray and I pray and I might pray to Allah or you, I pray to this God or I'm a Hindu God or one of their thousands of gods. We're all praying, but it all lands in the same spot. Really, that's not true. There's an exclusivity to the person of Jesus Christ. That's why we pray in his name. That's the person we're praying to. It's not a general prayer to whoever's up there listening. We're praying to the God of the Bible in in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. And Ben talked about that last week, and then he talked about his program. So we pray to his person, hallowed be thy name, and to his program. And Ben talked about that last week, about how we want on earth to be the, the will of God. We want God's will to take place here. And we know God's will, because it's stated in the Bible, is that none should perish. It breaks God's heart that this world is broken. It's not how he intended it for it to be, but he allowed man to have his own decision-making power, its own free will. And because we're all wired selfishly, we all make mistakes and break that covenant. So sin entered the world and it's broken. But we want our actions and our life to match like that is in heaven. We're in heaven. As Ben mentioned last week, everyone's a worshiper of God. And so those are the things he talked about. Now we're going to look at the next two verses, verses 11 and 12, and talk about prayer and how the formula for the prayer that Jesus gave us, and it's, it's pretty simple, it's challenging in that it, just even studying this, it's like, man, I'm not doing some of these things or I'm not doing them to the extent that I should. But I've heard this illustration, and I apologize if you've heard it before, I've used it before, but it's one that's always stuck with me. It was back years ago when this company was logging. This was before modern technology where they'd use advanced equipment to log something. It was men swinging an axe. And this guy comes to the foreman, and he says, I'd like a job working here logging in this area. And he goes, okay, we'll try you out, but we have a quota, meaning you have to effectively cut down X amount of trees a day in order to get paid and to do this. Well, this guy goes out first day. He not only meets the quota, he exceeds that. He cuts down almost twice as many trees as as required by this company. 
course, the foreman, he's impressed. He loves He's like, yeah, you're hired. The next day, he exceeds the quota. Not quite as much as he did the first day, but he still cuts down more trees than required. And the third day, not quite as many. And this trend keeps going, meaning he's still cutting down more, but it's less each day. And then it gets to the point where he's just making the quota. Well, at least he's making the quota. Well, then a few more days pass, and now he's not even making the quota. And he's falling way behind. And he's out there working, but he's not cutting down as many trees. Finally, the foreman approaches him and says, Hey, we were so impressed with you from day one. But we got to be honest, you're not even hitting quota anymore. He goes, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm trying. I'm working. I'm swinging the axe as hard as I can. I'm working as fast as I can. And the foreman picks up the axe and he looks at the edge and he's like, Man, this is dull. There's no edge on here. It's, sh- it's not sharp at all. You got to stop, sit down, and sharpen the axe. He goes, I don't have time to do that. I got all these trees that need to be cut down. And that oftentimes is how we are in prayer. We're going through life. And we have so many things that I do this, honestly, in ministry. To where I'm thinking, I don't have time to pray for for this event. I got to get this event ready. I don't have time to to pray for this thing I'm doing for our church. I got to get to work on it. And honestly, it's just a form of arrogance that says... I'm doing this in my power, not God's. And what happens is, just like that logger, you become exhausted, you get burnt out, and you're not being fruitful. You're not being productive. So prayer is so important. It's an asset that we have that we often underutilize. And today we're going to look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 11 and 12, and see the next two things that the Lord gives us in the model of prayer. In verse 11, it says, Give us today our daily bread. And verse 12 says, forgive us of our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Let's pray. God, we love you. We thank you that you show us how to pray. That God, the fact that we can even talk to you is only because of Jesus. It's only because of the cross that a guy like myself who just has filthy, nasty sin in my life can be made whole and clean is all because of Jesus, and we thank you for that. And I pray that this time, as we study your word, we'll be fruitful, and that we'll apply what we learn. We ask this in your name. Amen. First thing, if you're taking notes, write this down. Our prayer life should reflect our dependency on God. Our prayer life should reflect our dependency on God. Um, if it doesn't, or if you get, like I'm saying about me, where I'm often too busy and I'm like, I need to throw a prayer in, kind of a tip my hat to God, or it's something we do, or sometimes if you're like me and you grew up in church, you've kind of, um, have formatted prayers, you know, what are we praying for? Care group? Okay, I can pray for care group, small group, or, oh, it's time to eat. God bless this food to the nourishment of our body. You know, you kind of, it's almost automated. You have this and you spit it out. It's not personalized at all. And again, I'm not saying that's the worst thing in the world, but it's kind of what we reduced prayer to. It's kind of a church thing we do, but here this verse is saying that we are to show in our prayers how dependent we are on God. See, this says, give us this day our daily bread. Of course, bread in the Middle East where Jesus lived and even today is the most essential food product they have. That's true of a lot of the world. And here it symbolizes the nourishment you need to exist. So in the model prayer that the Lord gives us, says you need to show your dependency on God. He's saying, I need you. I need this. Without food, without nourishment, our bodies will dwindle. The functionality gets lower. Eventually we'll die if we don't have a source of nourishment and food. And that's the example Jesus gives us in this prayer. You need to pray like your life depends on it. Not because, oh, I'll physically die if I don't pray, but because your spiritual life, you need that connection with God. And I think it's hard for us to realize that sometime, especially in the culture that we live in. Um, Of course, then it was the staple food. Uh, All throughout the Bible, bread universally is used to symbolize what we eat, our nourishment, and that stuff. Plus, there's kind of a throwback here, because this is in the New Testament when Jesus was on the earth. He gave this example in, in person to his disciples and to those listening to his sermon on how to pray. But when he says our daily bread, it's reminiscent of in the Old Testament, hundreds and hundreds of years prior, to where God's chosen people, the Israelites, had been taken captive. 
Um, in the country of Egypt, the Pharaoh, who is like their president, um, was kind of a tyrant, and he took these people and he used them as slave labor. They were making bricks, different things. Well, God appears to this kind of a regular Joe named Moses. He's just a blue-collar guy, not very eloquent of speech, and he says, hey, I'm going to use you to free these people. It's a whole long process. It's an interesting story. If you haven't read it, I, I recommend that you do. And then he gets them out of Egypt, and he's taking them to their new home, this promised land, the land of Canaan. And in the process, this is not a short trip. This is like a long nomadic journey. Okay, so and it's thousands and thousands of people, and they're all following their leader Moses, and at times they get cranky, and at times they complain about things, even to the point they're like, we wish we were slaves back in Egypt. That's how miserable this trip is. And they would get hungry, but the, here's the thing. God always supplied their needs. And he did so at one point when they'd wake up, because again, they're like, they would camp, they'd get up, walk, 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 camp, and, and just this large group of people going to this promised land. And one day they wake up, they come out of their tent, and kind of like frost, there's this substance there. In fact, they, the Hebrew word for, that means what, is, um, it was where they get the word um, ha, uh, manna. It means man. And so this is manna from heaven, they called it. Because we would just somehow from the sky fall and it was there they found out if you look in the new the old testament book of numbers and exodus you can see that they could grind it they can make bread out of it they can use it a lot of different ways and every day out there god was saying i'm providing your needs here is your daily bread and so they got out of their tent they would take it and then they had bread for the day in fact god was very clear he told moses to tell them don't take more than you need for the day make sure you have you know your breakfast lunch dinner but don't try to store it up and if you read in Exodus chapter 19, at the end of it, a few people who said like, oh, I'm glad you provi God provided this, and they gathered it up, and they're like, you know what, I'm going to take a little extra. That way, I know we're good for tomorrow. I mean, God delivered today, but what if, you know, I were in, the Bible says that stuff overnight would be destroyed. It would mold, it would mildew, it would fall apart. Why did God do that? Because he's teaching them, you have to be dependent on me. You, your survival is based on my existence and love for you. So when Jesus says, when you pray, pray, God, give us this day our daily bread, it, it's teaching us here that, hey, we need this. You need God. It's his provision that we're talking about. It's his person, Father who art in heaven. It's his purpose, thy will be done. But it's also his provision saying, give us this day our daily bread. And if anyone thought, you know what, God's done good, but I need to supplement that. So I'm going to take a little extra. It, it was spoiled. It would mildew. It would mold. It would be ruined. And it was God's way of saying, I am your provider. And I'll say this, the flip side of that is, if you and I start our day with any place other than talking to God and asking him and thanking him for what he's provided, it's flat out arrogance. It's kind of the picture of, and I don't think any of us would say this out of hate, but it's kind of the picture. If we're doing anything in life and not taking it before God the Father through prayer, we're kind of telling God, hey, I got this. God, I don't need you in this. And you're probably sitting there thinking, well, Jason, I, I'd never tell God I don't need him. Well, when you don't go to him, when we don't show our dependency on him for our very life, we're kind of saying, hey, I don't need you. That bread outside their tent, it had a baffling arrival, a unique consistency, and a short expiration. All to show God's people your dependency and my dependency on him. And this is... Here's the truth. The God of the universe will meet your needs. And you guys are in high school, and so, I don't know, this is a very pivotal time of life. It's always why I love this ministry, is because um, you're becoming adults. Some, as we saw in the video, right before our eyes. But, you know, it is. It's a transition time. And the next 10 years will probably sh determine a lot in your life. I mean, you're 15, 16, 17, 18. You go 10 years from now, you're going to talk about careers, spouses, maybe kids. I mean, a lot of things are going to happen in your next few years that could set you on a trajectory for the rest of your life. How are we not going to God every day and saying, I'm dependent on you? And it's kind of hard, especially as Americans, um, 
because our country is built on rugged individualism, um, and it's how, the, how it was established, and <clears throat> it's not a bad thing as a country, because, hey, here you have opportunity. You can build your life with your own two hands. You can, <clears throat> excuse me, pulling a bin here. Um, you can build your own life. You can kind of set your own course. You can get out of life what you put into it. That's kind of the American way. And again, as a country, that's okay. But as a God who is the Lord of our life, that is not the case. And so you've got to switch gears and say, it's not about me or anything I can do. It's all about God. And that's what we see in Exodus. If they gathered extra manna, it's spoiled because they had to be 100% dependent on God. Hear me, tonight, the breath in your lungs is 100% dependent on God. The gravity holding us to this spinning rock that we call earth is 100% God. The image that you and I were formed in is God's image. Of all the things he created, he created us to look like him. The fact that you've ever lied in your bed and stared up at the ceiling and wondered what happens when we die. The fact that many in this room came to a point where they realized that our sin, our actions, our shortcomings separate us from holy God. And so maybe we cried out to him and confessed that we were sinners and, and committed to following him, believing that Jesus died for our sin. The fact that we were drawn to do that is 100% God. We can't even take credit for, at least I gave my life to God. The fact that we desired to do that was God's love reaching out to us. The fact that we can have eternity in heaven is 100% God. We have nothing to do about it. So, the, Jesus put this in this prayer, this model prayer, because he knows that a balanced Christian walk has to have dependency. We have to realize, and maybe you've grown up in church, and I know many of you, and some of you I know are really good people. Um, and sometimes we could be like, well, you know, God saved me from our sins, but I, I never really murdered anybody, and I... Didn't really have a cussing problem. I got saved at a young age. So morality-wise, it's not like my life radically changed, okay? Because I've always kind of been in a Christian home or never really been a bad kid or a bad person. Our salvation is 100% dependent on God. We were no closer to redemption than anybody else because our sin completely separates us. So we're 100% dependent on God, and that's what this verse is teaching. God, give us this day our daily bread. Give us the very thing I need to nourish, to live. Not just live, but to thrive. Not just thrive, but thrive for his glory. That's God's plan. And so for me to get up and say, I got a lot to do. Or even worse, in my case, I got a lot to do because I got to work at the church. And here I am in my own power and with an arrogant heart or a prideful heart saying, I got this, instead of taking everything I have to God. And not just your day, but your school, your decisions, your friends, your dating life, taking all that before God, saying, God, I'm dependent on you. Will you give me what I need to, to be the person you want me to be? Will you give me what I need? He'll always provide for our needs, not always our wants, because that's not what a good father does. And Ben kind of talked about that last week. A good father doesn't give his kids everything he wants. It may make you popular with your kids when they're little. Uh, two boys, you know, and if, they, if everything was what they want, they would stay up to two in the morning and eat fudge rounds for dinner. I get to do that. They do not, okay? I'm, I don't live with my dad anymore, so I can do that. But no, a good father doesn't give their kids everything they want, but he'll give them everything they need. And that's what this prayer is about. But on the same wing, if, if you picture a plane, and here's that dependency, saying, God, I need you. It's not me, it's you. I bring nothing to the table in terms of morality. You know what the Bible compares all of our good works to? Um, the, the kind of clean version is filthy rags, okay? And it just... It's just saying your good works, your morality, your good deeds, and we should do that. It's the result of Jesus living in us. It doesn't amount to nothing. The fact that we have a relationship with God and a home in heaven is all because of Jesus and the cross. So we're 100% dependent on him. But the other side of that wing is a thing called obedience. So if you look at all these requests, in the, like this, the verse we're getting ready to read, it says, forgive us as we forgive our debtors. There's a request from God and an action on our part. So I'm saying, God, would you forgive me as I forgive other people who have wronged me? 
So I'm requesting God to do something, but it's also an active part in me. Not because God needs anything from me, but a lot of times he requires something from me. His ability is to do whatever he wants. The fact that God uses us is a blessing at all. So there's always, there's dependency, but there's got to be obedience. And you have to have both or that plane will not fly. If you just are dependent, honestly, if you're just so dependent on God that you don't follow that up with anything, it's called lazy. You know, it's almost like I don't need to do anything. God's, God will take care of it. Well, God in his divine sovereignty, even though he does not need us, may require something for us for his will to be done. You know, it could, it, I've had people and they're like, oh, just pray for me. I'm looking for a job. And I'll always pray with them. And man, there's stuff out there and hope you find a job, this, that, and the other. Where, where are you looking? We're like, well, I haven't looked anywhere. I've just been praying. Okay, well, God can work however he wants and he's sovereign and he can throw that job in your lap. But maybe you should get out and get your resumes out. Well, I'm just depending on God. Well, maybe God in his sovereignty has that job three interviews away and you're not doing anything. So if we're total dependency, it could just be laziness. The other side of that is obedience. That we, we have a role in this, just like in these prayers. God, forgive me as I forgive them. A request of God, but an action on our end. And so if you're all just about obedience and not dependent, say, that's when you're saying, I got this. It's prideful. It's arrogant. So, first thing we have to do is make sure that our prayer represents our dependency on God. A lot of times our prayer becomes a grocery list of things we want from God. Oh God, would you please help me? God, I want to make that team. I want to be in this. I want to do that. Or you're walking in class. Oh God, I did not study for this test at all. Would you in your sovereignty give me wisdom to get a C? You know, reasonable request. Um, Second thing is, our prayer life should include confession and seeking forgiveness. This is verse 12 that we just read. It says, forgive us of our debts as we also forgive our debtors. This thing, even if you've, it, I feel like it's, you've probably heard it, but it's, it's kind of suppressed, I feel like a lot of times, because it's so daunting. Um, and again, two parts of this request, the correlation between asking God to forgive us is correlated to how we forgive others. And so, you know, Jesus explains this. In fact, it's just a few pages over in Matthew chapter 18. And this is a parable Jesus tells. Um, so Jesus, you know, he, he had, he's God made flesh, so he's fully man. And trying to explain things to mankind, he would often tell a story, an illustration, same way like a Pastor Kenny preaches. And he would do that to tell, he would tell an earthly story so it, they would understand a heavenly meaning. And this is the story... But he tells in Matthew 18, beginning in verse 21, because Peter came to Jesus and asked, how many times should I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Like Peter even threw out a suggestion. Like, you know, hey, what are you thinking? I'm seven. What about seven? You know, if he, the eighth time, uh-uh, done. I'm not forgiving him. And Jesus says like 77 times. And it, by the way, it's not an exact, he was just saying, it's beyond what you can think. And then he tells this story. I tell you, he says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. These are people who owed him money. As they begin the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought up to him. That today would convert to millions of dollars. Okay, so this guy owes millions of dollars. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. But the servant fell to his knees before him. To be, he said, be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master, this guy owes him millions of dollars, took pity on him. And not only did he say, fine, I'll give you some time, but I need monthly payments. He just said, the debt's canceled. You're good. You can go, but you don't owe me anything. Owed him literally millions by today's numbers, but says, just go. So this guy gets up. I mean, and when he said sells wife, it's probably like in a human trafficking, sex life. I mean, they're going, who knows what they're going to do with his wife and kids and all his belongings to pay this debt that this guy could not pay. And the master says, I forgive you of your debt. You can go. So the servant gets up. He went out and he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. This is the equivalent of a couple hundred dollars. Okay. Just got of a guy, let him free of an owed debt of a million dollars, comes across the guy who owes him a couple hundred dollars. He grabbed him by and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back a couple hundred dollars. 
but he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown in prison until he could pay the debt. While the other servants saw what happened, they were greatly distressed and went to the, to the master and told him everything that had happened. Verse 32, And the master called the servant in and he said, You wicked servant, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't have you had the mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back what he owed. This is the last thing Jesus says in this story. Verse 35. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brothers from your heart. So the forgiveness that I receive from God is directly correlated to how I forgive other people. Think about that. And maybe you guys are good on this. But it can be very daunting. See, when we don't forgive, we respond in a, a one of a few ways. We take revenge, we play the victim, uh, we drop people from our lives, we decide someone is going to pay. Even if it's not the person who committed the offense, we gossip, we complain, we wallow in our own misery, and it will cut out ourselves from everyone. It will just pretend like it never happened, even if it hurt. But unforgiving is a sin that we must deal with. And if I'm, I can stand here, I could worship, I could know the songs, I could participate in church activity, but if I'm not willing to forgive someone else, I can't be right with God. If he's going to forgive me at the same rate that I forgive others, think about that in your own life. I mean, you know your heart, I don't, but how does that look? Because we so love God's forgiveness, just like this guy begging. We want that, we, we need that. And that's why it's such a scary sin because unforgiving, it's more subtle than most sin. It's not as glaring, okay? A lot of times maybe we're the only ones outside of God who knows about it because it can be malicious in our heart. It's more common, I believe. And it's more dangerous. Because if we're not doing that, how's God going to forgive us? See, in verse 24, we see the man owed millions. Hear me. Jesus used that big number because it's a debt that that man in this story could never repay. He didn't have the resources. He didn't have the money in the bank. He didn't have the assets to liquidate. There is nothing that guy could do in his whole life to repay the debt he owed the master. And that's exactly where you and I are at. We try, sometimes we think there's still this kind of misconception um, that, you know, I hope I go to heaven and it's a result of whether my good outweighs my bad, you know. I messed up last week or I've cussed a little bit today, but if I do better here, if I do three bad things and ten good things and help with egg and do some things that are moral, that good will outweigh my bad. But hear me, there is nothing you and I can do to pay the debt that our sin has caused. It takes a perfect sacrifice. It takes something whole and pure that is unblemished. And no amount of good in our life can outweigh that sin that separates us from God. In fact, the perfect sacrifice was the man named Jesus. On the event that we'll celebrate in a couple weeks called Easter. We're the only person to walk this earth who is qualified to enter heaven and worship and be in communion with God the Father because he had never broke that relationship, said, I'll take on all the debt, all the sin, all the transgression, all the nastiness, the perverted thoughts, the bad speech, the pride, the malice, the temper, all those things, and I'll take it upon my perfect self just so Jason Irving can have a chance to be free of it. Just so a normal guy can have a relationship with God the Father. Just so a regular Joe who does not deserve heaven could go there because of what Jesus did on the cross. How arrogant is it for me to look at someone else and say, I'm not forgiving him. And in the story, Jesus is very clear in what he's saying here. A couple hundred bucks versus millions. No one has offended me the way I've offended God. But yet I'll hold malice and an unforgiving spirit towards somebody, even though a perfect loving God had to put all my sin on his son. And if you read the story, turn his back on his son. And you say, why would God turn his back on his son? Because his son became sin. Because of me. God couldn't look at him because God's holy. It's the same thing that broke my relationship with God. 
Thankfully, Jesus took that sin, was put in a tomb, and three days later came back to, earth, back to life. And in doing so, defeated sin and defeated death. And you and I get to enjoy that reward. Who am I not to forgive someone else? The debt is released in verse 27. That's grace. The guy couldn't pay it, but he, but he owed it legitimately. And the master let it go. That's what God did with us with Jesus on the cross. But then we see the selfishness when he wants a few bucks back from a guy who, a, a fellow peasant, it says, a fellow servant. But hear me, unforgiveness is its own prison. It's self-induced tor torture. It's a ball and chain. It'll hold us down. No matter what someone has done to you, forgiveness is your choice. And God always, I'm just going to read through several verses and you'll hear always the correlation in here. Colossians 3.13, it says, Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. You want to know how you should forgive people? As God forgave you. How many, you don't, don't raise your hand, but I'll be the first to. How many times have I confessed for the exact same sin? That sound familiar? Like an habitual sin to where you're like, I meant it when I confessed it, but then I was weak and I messed up. You're almost embarrassed to go back to God. God, you know, and he knows it, he sees it, but he's forgiven me for the same sin multiple times. Listen to Ephesians 4.32. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ God forgave you. How do we forgive others? Like God forgave us. Matthew 6, 14 and 15, For if you forgive men when they sin against you, this couldn't be more plain, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive you your sins. Mark eleven twenty five. 25, And if you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you of your sins. That verse is teaching us when it comes to worship, prayer, communion with God, we can't do any of it until our hearts are right with other people. Okay? And you can't control other people's actions, but you can control yours. And I know we always feel like our situation is special because someone just really, they, they did us wrong. And like, it's almost like these verses don't apply. Like, I, I get that. I've heard the Bible. But let me tell you what this guy did. Okay? And once you hear it, you understand why I'm not forgiving him. Well, couldn't God say that about me? You know how many times Jason Irvin has asked me for forgiveness? And how many times on the same issue of his pride or his temper or something? And, you know, God has all the reason in the world not to forgive me. But his love and his grace trumps that. So how am I to hold any malice towards anyone else? Your level of forgiving is equal to how much you will be forgiven. Luke 6, 37, 38 says, Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Again, we see the obvious correlation of how we forgive versus the forgiveness we'll receive. Uh, John Wesley is a, gosh, I think 18th century, 1700s, um, a a theologian and uh, kind of the, developed the Methodist church, if I remember correctly. But uh, a general said to him he, one time, to John Wesley, he said, I never forgive and I never forget. To which Wesley replied, then sir, I hope you never sin. Because if you're not going to forgive other people, God's not going to forgive you. But we begin to mistake our own feelings towards someone as God's feelings. Like almost like God's in agreement with this. I'm, ma I'm holding this unforgiveness, but, but I think God would agree with me on that. When obviously scripture says otherwise, but we think God would side with us when observing the situation. We can get off track pretty quick when it comes to that. But let me clear up some things because there's some misconceptions about forgiveness. And I, I, this is an exhaustive list, but one, forgiving someone doesn't mean that you think whatever they did was now okay. Okay? If, if I'm mad at Hannah and I'm not forgiving her about something, it's not like I have to say, and I'm using Hannah because she was, she's perfect, but um, it's not to say, okay, I'm, I'm, okay I'll, I'll say that what Hannah did wasn't wrong. That's not required for forgiveness. The, the transgression, what they did, can be completely wrong. I don't have to wait for her to make it right for me to forgive her, but it doesn't mean what she did or what the other person did is okay. It also, forgiveness doesn't mean it frees that other person of consequences. Okay? Actions have consequences in the real world. And, it, you know, there's just because you're forgiving someone doesn't mean that they shouldn't have consequence. You know, if I, somebody steals from me and multiple times and I say, I forgive you. Okay, well, can, is it okay if I have a key to your house? No. 
Um, I forgive you for what you did, but there's still a consequence for what happened. Um, forgiveness and recon reconciliation don't always go together. Meaning that, you know, I can forgive somebody even if they're not in the right spot. Or if they've never... I, I, forgiveness doesn't mean that, okay, now we've... He said he's sorry, and I said I'm sorry, or maybe I didn't know an apology, he did. And so now we've reckon, we're friends like we used to be. If that can happen, great, but it's not a prerequisite for forgiveness, okay? And, and I want you to understand that because, man, if there's ever a case of someone's mistreating you or abusing you in any manner, this isn't saying, well, you need to forgive them. No, you need to tell somebody. You can still forgive them, but they could... They need whatever consequence that is in their life, whether that's the authorities or whatever that needs to take place. This, you have to forgive everybody, isn't a pass for anybody can do whatever they want to you and you just have to take it, okay? This is just saying in your own heart, you don't want to be held back by not forgiving them. You can forgive them and tell someone you trust or the authorities or whatever the situation requires and they will have to deal with the consequence. But don't let their action keep you down spiritually in your relationship with God the Father because you will, you're harboring unforgiveness. Um, yeah, forgiveness doesn't mean that we have to treat the wrongdoer like it never happened. You know, especially in a case like that if someone abused you or something like that. Um, or I need to forgive someone. This is another misconception. I need to forgive them so that they're okay. No, that's for your own spiritual health. Because you see what's tied to this. You see the ball and chain effect here if we're not forgiving people around us. Here's what it really comes down to, and I'll wrap up with this, and I want to give you a little bit of a, I know you love homework, so just put something, if you have a desire to grow in this with me, I want to give you some stuff to do that. But unforgiveness is really a form of hatred, okay? Um, which hatred's kind of a lack of love. And it's why God is so forgiving, because he, God is love. He's not just full of love. The Bible says he is love. And so if you are bitter with somebody, then that's an issue of the love of Christ not flowing through you. And so, how do we solve that problem? Well, we need to grow in God's love. We need to grow in God's love. We need to come to a deep realization about the beautiful love that he has for us. And as we learn more about his love for us, our spirit will respond with how we love others in return. And when we, even in realization of this, that's why Jesus gave this illustration. Man, this guy owed millions. And this guy owned a couple hundred. Well, if I realize what my, the consequence of my sin, how that's separated from me from God, and eternity in hell, that's not God being mean. It's what I deserve. And sometimes we throw around hell like, oh yeah, it's a bad place. No, it's really torment. It's physical torment. Unending. And I've escaped that all because of Jesus what that kind of love, if I, the more I learn and grow in that, the more I'm likely to say, you know what, I'm not going to harbor bitterness or unforgiveness or malice towards someone else because God could justly do that for me. But he doesn't give us, he gives us what we don't deserve, which is grace. And when he doesn't give us what we do is we deserve, it's mercy, okay? And so the more we learn his love, the more it becomes natural to see Christ's forgiveness flowing through us. And most of us, <clears throat> we're pretty equipped on how, how God loves us because each of us know the worst of us, you know. We know stuff about ourselves that maybe no one else in the world knows. But God knows it, and his love and his son's act on the cross covers that. So knowing that, who am I to hold it out on someone else instead of forgiving them? So how do you come to know the love of God? You spend time with him. Research his word. Um, see what he says about his great love. Hear these stories about where he demonstrated his love. Didn't just talk about it, he showed it. Work on developing an intimate relationship with God and you will come and know his love. And, and honestly, we have a slide of some verses. I would say, if you could, these verses that we have here, take a picture of that or write them down. Maybe make that a part of your morning for the next week. Um, because these are just a lot of, it's not an exhaustive list by any means, but I always think, what do I do from here, okay? If God's forgiving me is directly correlated to how I'm forgiving others, I need to improve in how I forgive others. Well, how do I improve in others, forgiving others? I have a greater appreciation and knowledge of God's love. And where do I learn that? By knowing God's heart. 
by seeing what he didn't just talk about, he did. So as you look at these verses, so this is kind of part one. Um, and I'm not saying you have to read them all tonight. Maybe, maybe in, you know, there's five of them there. Take the next five, read it, and repeat that, and just have, let it saturate your heart. I guarantee you, if you do this, it'll, it'll change your day. It'll change how you see people when we talk about, man, God loves me so much. How arrogant is it me to harbor unforgiveness to others? The second part, and I'll close with this. Remember, you aren't loved for what you've done, but because of who you are. You're not loved because, and I, and I know most of you, you're, you're good young men and women. You're not loved because you're athletic. You're not loved because you have a good family. You're not loved because you, you do church things and, and you try to be an overall good person. You're not loved because you make good grades. You're loved because of who you are, created in God's image. There was no prerequisite for God to love you. You didn't have to start going to church. You didn't have to say that you believe in Jesus. You didn't have to be baptized. You didn't have to even know his name. In fact, the Bible says in Romans 5, 8, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. God loves you just how you are. In fact, there's nothing you can do to increase his love for you because his love is unconditional. He's, the, he, he lavishes love on you. He's head over heels in love with you. No one on this earth, and some of you I know have great parents and you have coaches and you have people in your life that inspire you and believe in you and help you and forgive you and mentor you. And their love is great, but not as great as God's love for you. And he demonstrated that. That's why 1 John 4, 9 says, In this was manifested the love of God towards us. Because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him.